Hi everyone, how are you today? Welcome to my video again. Today, I would like to share with you about a subject in biological psychology. It's about sensory systems. Let's learn psychology with me. Let's get started. Sensation and perception. What is sensation? Sensation is the physical stimulus. Perception is the interpretation of the sensations. The objects and events that produce the sensations. The visual system, albedo. Albedo is the proportion of incident light that a surface reflects. Surface reflectance is the proportion of light falling upon a surface that it reflects. Vision. Visual stimuli detected by photoreceptors that are rods and cones. Rods are more sensitive than cones. Rods dominate in retinal periphery. How about cones? There are three types of cones, blue, green, and red, responsive in daylight conditions and underpin color vision. You can see here on the picture on the left-hand side, here there is light, the cones, they are green, red, and blue colors. And then rod here, it's probably just gray. Vision, photoreceptor response is transmitted and processed by horizontal, bipolar, and amacrine interneurons. Retinal output is carried by retinal ganglion cells. Let's look at the picture here and the information as well. You can see here on the picture that light enters the front of the eye and reaches the retina. Photoreceptors at the back of the retina convert light into signals and send them to bipolar and retinal ganglion cells. Look at the box here, retinal ganglion cells and bipolar cells. Axons from retinal ganglion cells form the optic nerve which carries signals from the eye to regions of the brain that process vision. Those regions include the lateral geniculate nucleus, which relays signals to the visual cortex. You can see on the picture here, lateral geniculate nucleus that sends signals to the visual cortex. Cross-section through typical vertebrate eye. Light has to pass through layers of ganglion cells and interneurons before it reaches the rods and cones, the photoreceptors. You can see here on the right-hand side, light comes through here, uh, optic nerve, then uh, comes through the ganglion cells. As you go through here, the bottom of the picture, you see rods and cones. Retinal processing. Retinal ganglion cells have circular receptive fields divided into center and surround subregions. This lateral inhibition responds to edges but not to uniform illumination. 
on and off center ganglion cells with superimposed receptive fields give complementary responses. When the on-center cell responds strongly, the off-center cell is quiet and vice versa. Look at the picture on the left-hand side. There is the on-center of surround. And then on the right side, you can see a circle with off-center on surround. Those are the receptive fields. Retinal processing of wavelength. Stimulus wavelength encoded by three types of cones, each of which is most sensitive to a different wavelength. Retinal interneurons combine the outputs of the different types of cone to produce color opponency. What is color opponency? It's the theory of color vision in which colors are arranged in antagonistic pairs. For example, yellow is the opponent of blue and green the opponent of red. You can see here the picture on the right side, wavelength. Human rod cells and the different types of cone cells each have an optimal wavelength. However, there, there is considerable overlap in the wavelengths of light detected. You can see on the box as well, there are S-con, rod, M-con, and L-con. Defective color vision. Prot anomaly, the peak sensitivity of the pigment in the L-cones is shifted towards medium wavelength. Reds become difficult to distinguish from greens. Deuter anomaly has a similar perceptual effect. The peak sensitivity of M cones is shifted towards longer wavelengths. Treat anomaly. Blues are difficult to distinguish from yellows as the peak sensitivity of the S cone pigment is shifted towards medium wavelength. Spatial and temporal changes. Midget ganglion cells, or P, are particularly sensitive to spatial change. Their responses are sustained throughout the stimulus. Parasol ganglion cells, or M, are particularly sensitive to temporal change, have a much more transient response. Change blindness is the inability under some circumstances to be able to detect quiet major changes in the visual scene. The visual pathway. The axons of retinal ganglion cells form the optic nerve and project via the optic chiasma to the lateral geniculate nucleus. You can find the optic chiasma on the picture on the right side, just in the middle part, optic chiasma. Fibers from the temporal half of the each retina do not cross over at the optic chiasma, whereas fibers from the nasal half do. Fibers from the nasal half, which is here on the picture, nasal half, it's the light blue, is in the light blue color. Fibers from the nasal half cross over at the optic chiasma you can see that the nasal half here in the light blue color cross over at the optic chiasma so that the two images of an object are processed together in the visual cortex. The visual cortex is on the bottom part of the picture.
the lateral geniculate nucleus or LGN. LGN. The lateral geniculate nucleus or the LGN consists of six monocular retinotopically made layers. Two inner magnocellular layers called motion. Four outer parvocellular layers called color and detail. Between the layers, corneal cells called color. On the picture here, you can see that there are six monocular retinotopically mapped layers on the left and right side here. The visual cortex, simple cell, cell type in the visual cortex that responds to oriented feature of an image that falls within its receptive field. Receptive fields of cortical cells or simple cells are elongated and orientation selective. Cells are arranged in orientation selective columns. Many cells have receptive fields in both eyes. Separate groups of cells code the orientation, color, motion, and binocular disparity. On the picture here, you can see cortical simple cell receptive fields. The receptive fields typical of cortical simple cells. On and off subregions are represented by the plus and minus symbols and have the same meaning as in figure 6 2. Hmm. A cell with an on center receptive field like that on the left would respond well to a vertically oriented bar of light falling within the central subregion. A cell with a receptive field like that on the right would respond well to a suitably positioned light dark edge. As in the retina, there are equal numbers of on and off center cells and also light dark and dark light cells. Binocular disparity. What is that? Binocular disparity is the difference in the positions of the two images of an object in the two eyes. On the right hand side, you can see an example of that. The fixation points, the stimuli and motion of stimuli. Diagram of disparity change. As the object A moves forward the eyes to position B, its binocular disparity increases as its position on the retina changes. The purple arrows show direction of motion of the real object and the projection of the object on the retina. The visual cortex, the what stream originating in the parvocellular layers of the LGN projects ventrally to the temporal and inferotemporal cortex. The wear stream or magnocellular projects dorsally to the parietal lobes. There is further specialization into separate functional modules Processing specific aspects of the image, for example, motion information projects dorsally to V5. The auditory system. Sounds consist of a series of harmonics, a type of waveform, sometimes called a pure tone or a sine wave, that vary in frequency and amplitude. Sound is variation in air pressure over time. Frequency spectrum is the pattern of frequencies 
making up a stimulus. How the ear describes sound. Periodic stimuli causes the eardrum to vibrate. And then the vibrations transmitted by ossicles or tiny bones in the middle ear to the oval window of cochlea. Each pulse of the oval window causes a pulse to travel along the basilar membrane. Then, each point on the basilar membrane moves up and down as the pulse travels past it. The distorts of the cilia of the inner hair cells or the auditory receptors causes action potential in the fibers of the auditory nerve innervating the basilar membrane. Here is, here is the process of how the ear describes sound. The basilar membrane. Sounds throw the basilar membrane into a traveling wave. You can see here in the picture, basilar membrane on the bottom. The movement of the basilar membrane excites the hair cells. See, the movement at the basilar membrane excites the hair cell. Here you can see the outer hair cells in the green color, I'm um, sorry, in the yellow color. And the hair bundle here. Different frequencies cause maximum movement of the basilar membrane at different positions. In this picture, you can see basilar membrane at the bottom and then outer hair cell in the green, um, yellow color, as well as the hair bundle, and then uh, reticular lamina. You can also see the inner hair cell and tectorial membrane. Ear anatomy. They are inner ear, middle ear, and outer ear parts. Let's start from the inner ear. In the inner ear, we have cochlea, vestibular nerve, cochlear nerve, and eustachian tube. In the middle ear, we have tympanic membrane or eardrum, tympanic cavity, malleus, incus stapes, and semicircular canals. In the outer ear, we have cartilage, external acoustic meters or ear canal, temporal bone, temporal muscle, helix, scapha, triangular fossa, antihelix, concha, and auricular lobule or earlobe. <laughs> Coding. Place coding. Each frequency produces activity in different nerve fibers, so activity in a given nerve fiber should signal a specific stimulus frequency. Time coding. Respective of the identity of the nerve fiber, the interval between bursts should signal the duration of each cycle. So I guess place coding is more about the frequency that produces activity in different nerve fibers, while time coding is more about the interval between bursts that signals the duration of each cycle. The basilar membrane resolves the stimulus into its separate harmonics. The pitch of each harmonic is signaled by the identity of the responding hair cells, place code, and or the temporal pattern of their response, time code. 
place code is useful at high frequencies, while time code is useful at low frequencies. Locating sounds. Sounds are located by comparing the auditory signal in the two ears. Sounds from one side of the head arrive first, timing cues, and are louder, intensity cues in the closer ear. Sound location is first processed in the superior olivary complex, which receives input from both ears. Locating sounds. Timing differences are encoded by coincidence detectors receiving excitatory inputs from both ears. Intensity differences are encoded by cells receiving excitation from one ear and inhibition from the other. Timing differences are useful at low frequencies. Intensity differences are useful at high frequencies. This is a very important picture here on the right side. Let's look at the text. This figure, semantic figures of the auditory neural pathway. Let's look at from the bottom part of the picture. The auditory pathway starts at the cochlear nucleus. See here, there is a text there, cochlear nuclei. That's where the auditory pathway starts, cochlear nucleus at the bottom part. Then it goes to the superior olivary complex, the superior olivary complex, you can just follow the arrow here, is actually the second part in the picture, superior olivary complex. And then the inferior colliculus goes up to the top, to inferior colliculus, and finally to the medial geniculate nucleus. That's all, almost at the top. The information is decoded and integrated by each relay nucleus in the pathway and finally projected to the auditory cortex just on the top. This is the auditory pathways. I will repeat it. The auditory pathway starts at the cochlear nucleus at the bottom, then it goes to the superior olivary complex then the if inferior colliculus here, more on the top. And then finally, the medial geniculate nucleus going up. The information is decoded and integrated by each relay nucleus in the pathway. And finally projected to the auditory cortex just on the top. This is the auditory pathway. The auditory cortex. The primary auditory cortex is less understood than the visual cortex. As in vision, projection from the primary auditory cortex seems to be organized into functional streams. An anterior what projection focus, focus, focusing on pitch and speech perception. A posterior where projection focusing on spatial processing. The vestibular system. Look at the picture here on the right hand side. This is the vestibular system. The sacule and utricle in each inner ear detect linear accelerations of the head. See here on the right side, utricle and uh, sac the sacule here. Otolites embedded in a gelatinous membrane lag behind changes in the movement of the head, distorting hair cells and causing them to respond.
the vestibular system keywords. The vestibular system is involved in maintaining balance by detecting movements of the head. It consists of three semicircular canals in the inner ear that detect rotational accelerations of the head important in balance. Remember, three semicircular canals detect rotational acceleration of the head, rotational. The vestibular system also has two small organs, utricle and saccule. Utricular, utricle, organ of the inner ear that together with saccule detects linear, linear acceleration of the head. Saccule, organ of the inner ear that together with utricle, sorry for the mistypo error, detects linear acceleration of the head, important in balance. So in summary, three semicircular canals detect rotational acceleration of the head, while utricle and saccule detect the linear acceleration of the head. Linear acceleration of the head. Vestibular interactions with vision. Makes an important contribution to vision through the vestibular color reflex. Signals from the semicircular canals are used to rotate the eyes so that they maintain fixation during head rotations. Interacts with the visual system to stabilize vision and maintain balance, for example, swinging room experiment. Head movement normally produces matching visual and vestibular signals. When the signals do not match, for example, when traveling in a car, nausea may result. Touch. Touch receptors are Merkel's disc, Meissner's corpuscle, Ruffini ending, and Pacinian corpuscle. You can see the touch receptors on the picture. See the Merkel's disc for touch, Meissner's corpuscle is also for touch, and then Ruffini's ending stretch, Pacinian corpuscle vibration. You see also the hair epidermis and dermis, as well as the hair follicle receptor. You see also free nerve endings for pain and temperature. A cross section of the skin showing the location of receptors left and Ruffini cylinders in the palm as skin receptors detect skin stretching or joint movement, right? You can see these in the picture. Touch, sense organs in the skin. In the picture here, you can see the thermoreceptor senses heat, heat or cold, Meissner's cospulcal senses touch, nose receptor senses pain, Pacinian corpuscular senses pressure. You see also epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Touch pathway. Touch receptors are simply the modified ends of sensory nerves. Touch sensitive fibers enter the spinal cord. You can see here on the picture right hand side, touch sensitive fibers enter the spinal cord here, see? See the red line? And ascend directly to the top in the dorsal columns through the medulla here. Medullary neurons here, medulla on the top. So see the touch sensitive fibers enter the spinal cord and ascend directly in the dorsal columns to the medulla. You can see the medulla here up on the top. Actually, it's in the 
middle part of the picture, medullary, medullary neurons cross the midline and project to the somatosensory cortex via the ventral posterior nucleus, VPN. So here from medulla, it goes to, it goes up to the ventral posterior nucleus of the thalamus. VPN neurons have circular receptive fields like visual cells in the LGN. The somatosensory cortex is somatotopically mapped. Those sensitive regions, for example, fingertips, are proportionately larger than less sensitive regions, for example, shoulders. Later, Cortical processing may be divided into a ventral, what, and a dorsal wear stream. Here on the right side, you can see the picture of the touch pathway. St start looking at from the bottom first and goes up. Temperature and pain. Thermoreceptors and nociceptors rely upon transient receptor proteins, TRPs. Tissue damage causes a direct response in nociceptors and also release chemicals, for example, prostaglandins, that increase sensitivity and produce a longer-term response. We actually have the same picture here on the right side. Now it's about pain pathways. A spinal gate dorsal horn synapse controls the onward transmission of nociceptor response. Nociceptor response. Information projects directly and indirectly via the periaqueductal gray. PAG to the ventral posterior nucleus VPN of the thalamus and on to the somatosensory S1 and anterior cingulate cortex SEC and from there to several structures including insular cortex, amygdala and prefrontal cortex. There is also a downward path via the PAG, the periaqueductal gray, and the ref nucleus to the spinal gates. You can see the process here from the picture on the right hand side. The pain pathway is described by the blue line color. See that the pain goes to the dorsal column, it goes up to the anterolateral system, and it goes up and up through the ventral posterior nucleus in the brain. Pain relief. Pain has effective sensory and cognitive components. Pain signals can be interrupted at any stage of the pathway, for example, by NSAIDs or local anesthetics. NSAID and local anesthetic work peripherally. Some of the effects involve endorphins, endogenous opioids. Neuropathic pain can be very resistant to a treatment. Proprioception. Golgi tendon organs and muscle spindles are the main receptors for proprioception. Remember that. Golgi tendon organs and muscle spindles are the main receptors for proprioception. Both types of receptor project to the somatosensory cortex and to the cerebellum. Proprioception 
together with touch, vision, and balance, are integrated into a sophisticated body schema, the sense of our body's position in space. To make it short, proprioception or kinesthesia is sense of self-movement and body position, the sense that lets us perceive the location, movement, and action of parts of the body. It encompasses a complex of sensations, including perception of joint position and movement, muscle force, and effort. Let's look at the picture here. Proprioception. You can see here the brain receives and interprets information from multiple inputs. Vestibular organs in the inner ear send information about rotation, acceleration, and position. I send visual information. Stretch, stretch receptors in skin, muscles, and joints send information about the position of body parts. Taste receptors. Taste receptors fall into five basic types, sour, bitter, salt, sweet, and umami. I think umami is kind of new. Salt and bitter receptors are simple. The others use G proteins and a lock and key mechanism. Taste buds on the tongue may contain more than one type of receptor. The different types of receptor are evenly dis distributed across the tongue. On the picture here on the right hand side, you can see the taste pathway. Here's the tongue on the bottom here, and then you can see the corda, tympani, pharmix, vagus nerve, glossopharyngeus nerve, and then facial nerve, as well as nucleus and solitary tract. And then it goes to medial laminiscus, and then the ventral posterior medial thalamic nucleus, then it goes to primary gustatory cortex. At the bottom, you can see the picture as well. It's the taste receptor cell and basal cell. Taste pathway. Taste receptors project via the solitary nucleus to the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus, to the insular cortex, and on to the orbitofrontal cortex. I'm going to repeat it since it sounds complicated. The taste receptors project via the solitary nucleus to the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus, to the insular cortex, and on to the orbitofrontal cortex. The five basic tests are preserved in the early stages of the pathway. Many tests can be explained as simple mixtures of the five basic tests, but others are much less predictable and must be learned. Olfaction. Olfactory stimuli enter via the orthonasal, directly through the nose, or retronasal, from the back of the mouth root. Olfactory receptor neurons lie on the olfactory epithelium, each containing a number of receptors of the same type. We have about 300 to 400 types of olfactory receptor, each operating a different lock and key mechanism involving G proteins. Olfactory pathway.
Olfactory receptors project in the olfactory nerve to the olfactory bulb where they synapse with mitral cells located in glomeruli. The olfactory bulb is organized into a smell map with similar smells activating neighboring regions. Mitral cells project directly to the piriform cortex or the primary olfactory cortex. We thought a synapse in the thalamus and on to the orbitofrontal cortex where the smell is integrated with taste and vision. On the picture on the right hand side, you can see the main olfactory pathway from, let's see the text here, from the olfactory epithelium via the olfactory bulb to the olfactory cortex. You can see olfactory neuron, glomerulus, and two, olf two olfactory cortex and mitral cell. Smell perception. Olfactory stimuli stimulate more than one receptor type. Therefore, different smells reflect different patterns of activation. Smell is integrated with taste to give flavor. Different flavors often reflect very complex patterns of taste, smell, and visual activity, which cortical cells can learn. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much, everyone, for learning psychology with me. I hope you learned something new. I would like to see you again next time. Thank you for watching. See ya.